All right, everybody, we're going to talk about the hemolytic anemias here. And this can be a little bit complicated because there's a lot of them and they all have their differences, but they also all have their commonalities. So we want to really focus on the commonalities so that we can say, OK, yes, we've got a, hemoglo or a uh, hemolytic anemia and then focus on the differences so that we can distinguish one from the other. And I think by the end of this talk, you're going to have a pretty good idea. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I really appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications each and every time I put a new video up. All right, so hemolytic anemia is anemia that's due to the destruction of red blood cells. And so what will happen then is the red blood cells will spill everything out into the bloodstream, right? Um, now this can happen in the spleen or liver, which is extravascular hemolysis, or it can happen in the vasculature itself, which is intravascular hemolysis. Most commonly, it's going to be normocytic, uh, but it can be macrocytic, and you may even have a microcytic picture because if you are hemolyzing and losing iron, um, what's going to happen then is that uh, your red blood cells are going to be deficient if you're not replacing that iron. Um, so look for normocytic, but it's not perfect, okay? Now, in addition to the anemic symptoms, what you can see is other features primarily related to the elevated bilirubin. When hemoglobin is spills out in the bloodstream, it gets broken down, and bilirubin is one of the products. So you can get jaundice and icterus and pruritus due to the elevated bilirubin. You can get gallstones due to uh, bilirubin saturation. You can get hemosiderinemia, sorry, hemosiderinuria. Uh, and that's due to hemosiderin um, that then gets urinated out. Um, and you can also have constitutional features. You can also get splenomegaly as red blood cells get trapped in the spleen. And there's one particular hemolytic anemia where we see that most often. There are a number of hemolytic anemias that we're going to talk about. Um, now, I don't like classifying them as intravascular and extravascular because it's hard to appreciate clinically. I like to divide it up into Coombs positive and Coombs negative because when you have a patient with hemolytic anemia, you're pretty much always going to order a Coombs test. And that's going to break it up and give you an idea, a general idea of what you're dealing with. And when you add that to the clinical history, um, you'll really have a good idea. All right, so when do we suspect hemolytic anemia? You suspect it when you have an anemic patient with jaundice or uh, icterus or something like that. That's pretty classic. Um, now, what you're going to want to do, in addition to your typical uh, labs that you order in a patient who appears anemic, is that you want to get uh, serum LDH, haptoglobin, total bilirubin, and peripheral smear. And you're going to get that total bilirubin in the form of liver function tests, which is natural. I mean, if you've got a patient with jaundice, you're going to order liver function tests, and that will be on there. Now, in hemolytic anemias, you'll probably see a normocytic anemia. The LDH will be high. The haptoglobin will be low. I like to think of haptoglobin as kind of eating up the free hemoglobin, and so your haptoglobin goes down. Okay, I don't know if that's exactly how it works, but that's the way I like to think of it. And then the reticulocytes will be elevated. That's nonspecific. That just tells you you have an anemia and your body is responding properly to it. If you had a low reticulocyte count in the presence of an anemia, you're probably dealing with aplastic anemia. Now, the best initial step after getting your routine labs is Coombs testing. Coombs test, the direct Coombs test, will tell you if you're dealing with an autoimmune hemolytic anemia or not. And then, uh, as we're going to see, all patients who have anemia need folate supplementation because you're making new red blood cells, and one of the ingredients, if you will, in red blood cells uh, is folate. Now, I want to focus on the direct Coombs test because that is what we use to determine whether a hemolytic anemia is autoimmune or not. Um, so if you're taking step one, you'll want to know sort of the mechanism of how this test works. It does get tested on step one. If you're taking step two or three, just have a general idea of what a positive Coombs test means. Like I said, 
it means it's autoimmune if it's positive. All right, so this is just information for you. And so what I just want to point out is sort of a general idea of how this works. So say we've got red blood cells and we've got antibodies that are attached to them. What we add during a Coombs test, and we do this in vitro, is we add this antibody. It's, it's an IgG antibody against the FC portion of the suspected antibody that's attached to the red blood cells. And so because IgG is multimeric, it's going to attach to multiple red blood cells, the antibodies on multiple red blood cells, and so you'll get an agglutination. And so if you get an agglutination with a direct Coombs test, what that's telling you is you have antibodies attached to the red blood cells, aka you have an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. With the non-autoimmune hemolytic anemias like hereditary spherocytosis or G6PD deficiency, it's not mediated by antibodies, so you will have a negative direct Coombs test. All right, let's look at the autoimmune hemolytic anemias. The first is warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and it gets the name warm because there's a cold hemo uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, also called cold agglutinin disease, and that has a good reason why we call it cold. So we call this one warm just to distinguish it. It doesn't really have anything much to do with warmth, though. So this is a Coombs positive hemolytic anemia. Half of the cases are idiopathic. This is mediated by IgG that gets tested on step one. And that IgG attaches to the red blood cells and then targets them for destruction in the spleen. Now, most of the time, or about half the time, it's idiopathic. The other half of the time, it's associated with something like a lymphoproliferative disorder like CLL or an autoimmune disorder like lupus or RA. The diagnosis, the best initial test after getting your routine labs is the Coombs test, a direct Coombs test. And you may get a cold agglutinin titer. However, it's fairly easy to distinguish cold from warm based on clinical findings. We'll get into that. The treatment here, because we are making autoantibodies, we are making antibodies against the red blood cells, we want to give steroids because that's going to reduce the production of antibodies. We also want to give folate. Now, if that doesn't work, we can give rituximab. Remember that rituximab is, an, is a uh, monoclonal antibody against CD20, which targets B cells. B cells make antibodies, so we can come at it that way. But the best uh, initial step in therapy is prednisone. Now, cold agglutinin disease or cold hemolytic anemia is similar in that you have antibodies targeting the red cells, but here we're dealing with IgM. Now, that doesn't really matter as far as the um, fact that you're developing hemolytic anemia, uh, but uh, you may enjoy the fact that when you have IgM attaching to red blood cells, that is going to activate complement. Okay, so it's a little bit different. When you have complement activated, you'll get an intravascular hemolysis. So it all occurs in the, um, the vasculature. The key symptomatic differentiator from warm AIHA is that this will get worse when you're exposed to the cold. That will encourage agglutination. Um, it'll, it, it, it'll encourage complementation, I should say. Now, another thing that you may see on a test question is that um, they go outside in the winter and their fingers turn purple, and that's, uh, that, that is a classic sign. Again, here we do a Coombs test. It's going to be positive for the same reason. You can then do a cold agglutinin titer. It's the most specific test, and that will distinguish it from warm. AIHA. Treatment here is fairly similar. Uh, we do folate supplementation, but Instead of prednisone, which really doesn't work too well, you just tell them to avoid cold conditions. This is quite a bit less severe than the warm version. Now, drug-induced hemolytic anemia is a little bit different, but on a test question, um, it's going to be pretty straightforward. So what they're going to tell you is that a patient was given a drug and now they've got anemia and jaundice. Now, there are a number of drugs that can do this, but uh, the most common are the cephalosporins, okay? Now, oh, I should say, by the way, with uh, cold agglutinin hemolytic anemia, 
Uh, it classically comes after a mycoplasma infection, so walking pneumonia in young people, or mononucleosis. So look for a young patient with the cold hemolytic anemia. Now back to the drug-induced. Again, in the history, look for a patient who has recently put on a drug. Now they got hemolytic anemia and jaundice. Again, best initial test is a Coombs test. This will usually be positive, particularly if it's drug-induced. However, it's not always positive. So a negative test does not rule it out. Just look at the history. The treatment is to stop the offending cause. Again, folate supplementation. It is not very clear if steroids are effective, but if they are effective, it's going to be if you have a positive Coombs test because we're looking at antibodies in that case. All right, let's move on to the Coombs negative hemolytic anemias. So hereditary spherocytosis is not super common, but it does get tested. This is a defect of the red blood cell membrane. It follows an autosomal dominant pattern, so look for a history in a parent. Um, the red blood cells here lack a membrane protein, so they become very fragile and they lose their flexibility. Consequently, they can't squeeze through the spleen. They get trapped there. And because you're trapping all these red blood cells in the spleen, splenomegaly. So look for hemolytic anemia, with jaundice, icterus, and a splenomegaly. This is, although not very common, it's the most common hereditary hemolytic anemia. And you can suspect this based on the peripheral smear, which is gonna be part of your initial workup. You'll see spherocytes, and we'll, I, I got a picture of that. So again, when you have a family history uh, of hemolytic anemia, uh, look for spherocytes on the smear. That'll pretty much give you your answer. Um, osmotic fragility test is the most accurate test, uh, but you don't necessarily always need to do that. Um, so if there is no known history, then you don't necessarily know what you're dealing with. So then get a Coombs test to figure out whether this is autoimmune or not. Uh, but in many cases, you're going to have a family history. The treatment here, again, is folate replacement and elective splenectomy. The, the, the spherocytes are generally pretty good at functioning as red blood cells. The problem is they get trapped in the spleen. So if we remove the spleen, uh, then uh, we'll, we'll pretty, uh, pretty well ameliorate the condition. Um, that said, make sure you're doing immunizations if you ever remove the spleen. These are spherocytes. So the big thing to look for here are these very circular red blood cells with a loss of central pallor. And not all the cells are going to be spherocytes. Um, so here, this looks kind of like a normal uh, red blood cell. You can see the difference though. Here, you just don't have that central pallor. Okay. Now, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria has a very complicated mechanism, and it's not going to be tested on step two or three. It will be tested on step one. Okay, so I put the mechanism right here, but I don't want to go into it um, just because I like to focus on clinical medicine here. But if you are taking step one, know this. Know this because it's very important and it gets tested all the time. Basically, the way that this works is that you lack a a functional membrane protein that's responsible for preventing complementation, okay? You prevent complementation. If you're lacking that, you're going to complement your red blood cells and destroy them, okay? Now, this is called nocturnal because at night, our blood naturally gets a little bit more acidic, and that promotes complementation, okay? So, Watch for a patient who wakes up, has cola-colored urine because of the hemolysis, and then that gets better throughout the day because their blood loses that acidity that it had at night. Okay, so a patient who wakes up with cola-colored or tea-colored urine. There's also an increased risk for venous thrombosis because um, what's happening here is that complement will get on to the platelets as well because these... Uh, this, this membrane protein exists not only on red blood cells, but also on white cells and platelets. Now, what's going to happen is that you will complement your platelets and destroy them, but in addition, when you complement your platelets, they're going to be more likely to cause clots. And so what you can see then is an increased risk of venous thrombosis. So look for DVTs, look for uh, abdominal pain, um, any 
a symptom of a venous thrombosis, especially if it's in the patient's history. The most accurate test to confirm the diagnosis is flow cytometry. And what that's going to tell you is the deficiency of CD55 and CD59, which are part of that membrane-bound protein. And the treatment here is quite simple, it's eculizumab. And that is uh, a monoclonal antibody that is going to, um, it's going to accelerate the destruction of those complement convertases, um, which will then uh, reduce the amount of complementation going on. We also use that for atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. G6PD deficiency, you should be pretty familiar with this because it's classically tested on step one. This is an X-linked recessive condition. And so look for a uh, patient who is a male, uh, who has a uh, potentially a family history. Um, they're gonna get it from their mom. So look for a maternal uncle who is also affected. Now, basically the way this works is that you have a deficiency of NADPH due to the uh, due to the lack of this enzyme. So we're not making NADPH. NADPH is an antioxidant. Uh, and so if you lack that, your red blood cells are going to normally get oxidative stress. And whereas that NADPH would fix that, if you're lacking the NADPH, your red blood cells will become oxidated, the hemoglobin will become denatured, and uh, the spleen will kill those red blood cells. Um, look for uh, this to happen in certain populations, Black, Asian, Middle Eastern, Mediterranean. Uh, it can be linked to an infection, oxidative drugs like sulfa drugs, or certain foods like fava beans. Do not expect to get told fava beans on the test because it's just so classic and so uh, memorized. So look for acute attacks. These patients are fine and then there's some sort of trigger and they get hemolysis. This is generally pretty uh, benign, uh, but um, it, it, when it does present, it's uh, kind of dramatic. So on peripheral smear, look for Heinz bodies and bite cells, uh, and I'll show you what that looks like. If you did do a Coombs test, because this is not antibody mediated, it will be negative. The treatment here is just to stop the offending drug or the food. Okay, this is a uh, Heinz body here. They tend to be in the periphery of the red blood cells. This is just denatured uh, hemoglobin. And then when this goes through the spleen, the spleen can remove the Heinz body and it takes a little bite out of it. And so you get these little bites out of uh, the red blood cells, but otherwise they appear pretty normal. All right. This is just a recap of everything we talked about. So you want to know your general hemolytic symptoms. You want to know an initial workup. So um, we talked about that. You'll then want to know what the direct Coombs test means, that it's autoimmune. Um, and then um, there are these other uh, hemolytic anemias, which we will talk about in future talks. Um, you'll want to know the unique symptoms for each of these. So these features in addition to the hemolytic symptoms, and you'll want to know, especially for step two and three, the treatment.